Let's open up then to 1 John chapter 2, and let's pray. Father, thank you again, Lord, for a beautiful morning, uh, the opportunity to come together as a family and uh, in worship, my Lord. Uh, that alone is a privilege in and of itself, and yet, Lord, the ability to get together and spend time in your word as a family. Lord, I pray uh, that your word would speak to our hearts as individuals and then to us corporately as well, Lord, so that uh, as a body, Lord, your will would be done in, a, in each of us personally, Lord, it would be done. And so, uh, Lord, I pray as your children that you would put us on your lap and speak into our ears and our hearts, Lord, the things that you would have us know as we work through 1 John. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, gang, we will pick up at verse 29. Now, up to this point in 1 John, John has caused us to evaluate our fellowship uh, in ethical and Christological or in relationship to Christ, those kind of standards. Really, since verse 5 of chapter 1, he's been addressing this issue of fellowship with one another and fellowship with Christ and how, what it is that we should be doing and in light of who Jesus Christ is. Now here at chapter 2, verse 29, he changes topic. Uh, we're going to now look at our role as sons and daughters of God, but we'll look at it this morning ethically, and then next week ethically, uh, ethically, and then the following weeks we'll look at it again Christologically or in relationship to Jesus Christ. Some of you have noticed as you read 1 John, there's almost like a cyclical pattern that happens. You're like, well, he's kind of already mentioned this before. He has, but in the context of a different subject. But he, he applies the same standards to these particular topics he addresses. So the first one, of course, was our fellowship with God. Now then we begin looking at our sonship with God. So we pick up at chapter 2, verse 29 now. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteous, uh, righteousness is born of him. Now, John says, if you know that he is righteous, we have to define some terms here because... It doesn't always come through in the English, but the word know here is, is edo. It speaks of perception, um, of understanding, of conviction as well. It can, it can also speak of discernment. And, and, and so he's almost saying, if you have this conviction that he is righteous. Now the word righteous or his righteousness here, dikaios, now that particular word, speaks of being equitable in character or in your actions to be innocent or holy or just. But notice here who the standard is. He says, if you know that he is righteous. Whose righteousness do we look to? Yeah, do we look to each other's righteousness? No, we like to because then we can kind of compare ourselves. Well, I'm doing pretty good compared to that guy. Or we do the other thing like, oh, I'm a wretch compared to that guy. But we're not each other's standard, right? We don't, we don't uh, adhere to moral relativism. It's God's standard, and God is perfectly righteous, is He not? In fact, He's not mostly righteous, but by His very nature, He's perfectly righteous. And I want to make that point because there's, there's kind of that contemporary mantra, and I don't have a problem with it, you know, God is good all the time, and... Yeah, you watch cheesy Christian flicks and you'll pick that one up, right? <laughs> but this says something more than that. This is God is good all the time, at every moment, in every way. And if you truly understand this, John says, then there's something else you know. You know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Now, the word know here is different than the word know earlier in this verse. This isn't Edo, this is... Gnosko. Now, Gnosko speaks of experiential knowledge. And then he says, you know, or you've experienced, or you've come to understand that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Practice. How many of you like that word? 
It reminds me when I was a little kid and my grandmother arranged for me to have organ lessons because she had a little Hammond organ. I had to take organ lessons. Yeah. Three years, I still didn't know Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> but I loved flipping all the switches and the buttons and the vibrato and all the effects and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was a terrible thing. The word uh, practices, poeo, it, it means to produce or to construct, to form or to fashion, to shoot forth, or we might even understand bring forth is the idea. Um, and it's in the present tense. And so John, essentially, this is what John is saying, if I could paraphrase it. If you truly perceive that God is righteous, then you have learned experientially that everyone who, pra who is practicing righteousness is born of him. We lose some of the tenses between, between Greek and English. Now, this becomes then the primary principle for what we're going to read for the next 10 verses in chapter 3. But it, asks, it begs the question here, what does it mean to be born of God? Right? Everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, Jesus explained it to Nicodemus, right? You remember Nick at night? John chapter 3, Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or literally born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See, there's a spiritual rebirth that happens when someone comes to faith in Christ. It's the birth of a new nature. Now, in the fall of 1967, my mother's water broke, right? And I was birthed physically. And the strange thing is, in the 56 years since, I've become more and more like my father. In fact, it's kind of an interesting thing, but years ago, I got a Facebook request, a friend request from somebody in my hometown, you know, Lemonster, Massachusetts, okay, whatever, somebody named Evelyn. And Okay, if you get a friend request, it's probably good to creep, right? It's probably a good thing to creep around the... Um, their account and kind of find out who they is because you don't want to find out it's like some old high school girlfriend who has six divorces and 17 cats, right? You've got to, <laughs> you have to draw some boundaries, obviously. <laughs> so anyway, I uh, find out it's a cousin of my father's, you know, her name is Evelyn. That was my grandmother's name. She, you know, so it's family name. So anyway, she, uh, I, I befriended her, come to find out she's a believer. She found out I was a believer. So she, you know, Requested me as a friend. That's fine. The next message I got from her was, you look exactly like your dad, you know, which I, I appreciate because when I was young, now, my dad looked like William Shatner. Not, not, not like William Shatner today, okay? <laughs> I'm talking about William Shatner in the late 60s, you know, in Star Trek. My father had that, that forehead. He had that look about him. I was like, oh, okay, I like that. I look like my dad. That's, that's cool. You know, I'll, I'll take that, please. You know, a um, couple months later, she'd been watching my Facebook posts, and then she says, you know, your humor is just like your dad's. Uh, and truth be told, she was absolutely right, you know, because inevitably we're like our fathers, are we not? Well, in the summer of 1991, I came to faith in Christ, and there was a new birth that took place. There's a new nature inside of me, as the Holy Spirit took up residence. And, and since that time, ever so slowly, I admit, but I've been taking on my father's appearance, not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual likeness. I have a whole new set of habits. I'm not practicing certain things that I used to practice prior to 1991. Praise the Lord. There's, there's new things. Um, am I perfect in my practice? Probably not, right? Practice doesn't make perfect, but it does make proficient over time. And, and, and now, having come to faith, having come to some understanding regarding the righteousness of God, I've come then to realize that the true born-again believer ought to resemble his father. The nature of the father should become the habit of the children. I think that's a reasonable expectation. Not perfection. Perfection is not reasonable. Any perfect people here? No. Because if, if there are, you're going to be terribly disappointed this morning, and 
you know. I can help find a church full of perfect people, I suppose, if you want, you know. But no doubt you've experienced those who claim to be sons and daughters of God and yet practice no such righteousness. Have you met those over time? Sure. Because the proof really isn't on the label, it's in the box, right? And so John here establishes this principle that if you understand God's righteousness, you've come to realize that his children act in similar fashion. This is the, the sort of principle that's going to undergird the next 10 verses. So now we get to chapter 3, verse 1. We look at the privileges now of God's righteousness. John begins, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. John begins with the word, what? Behold. Nobody says, behold. You never say behold in a, in, a, in a little wimpy voice, do you? When you see the word behold, what's it say? Behold. It's a call to attention. Interestingly, though, it's the same word, edo, that we saw as being no in the previous verse. But there is an emphasis that's placed upon it here. And so this is a bold invitation to understand and to perceive something. Behold, what manner of love or what kind of love? John here infers a love that is unparalleled. What could possibly be compared to this love that the Father has bestowed upon us? Now, did anybody this week use the word bestow in, in any of your conversations with anybody? No. And so again, it's, probably necessary to define the term. The Greek word didomi literally means to grant something with an open hand. And so the picture that's painted is to give something without resentment or without reservation. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. You understand that when you were adopted into His family, He did it without reservation? He wasn't like... You were the last kid to be picked on a kickball team and he was stuck with you. That's not it at all. John, who walked with Jesus for three and a half years and has been preaching the gospel ever since then for 60, says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Please understand, gang, that God isn't looking down on you thinking, what did I do to deserve this? I think we, we because of our nature, we, we tend to view God that way. We sort of view God through our lens, but it's not accurate. God is pleased to bring you into His family. He's pleased to call you His child. In fact, the word called here means to declare loudly. You know, in a world that's full of labels, everybody gets a label. This is the one I want, amen? That I should be called a child of God. This is the divine adoption, God's decree over those who take Him at His word. Mankind was estranged from God when he disbelieved God in the garden. But now he's reconciled to God when they believe upon His Son. And think about it, you know, every orphan has this dream that one day they'll be reunited with their real family. You know, they'll be reunited with their parents who are absolutely loving and absolutely kind and absolutely wealthy. And, and in that context, the orphan would be absolutely secure, right? Isn't that sort of the, the orphan's dream? And that's your story if you've come to faith in Christ. We were estranged from God. Our sin separated us from Him. And absolutely unable to do anything about that situation, Christ's arms were outstretched for you and for me. And in light of that, then the Father bestows His love upon us. Outstretched arms to open hands. One of the greatest experiences of my life has been when we, Sandy and I adopted our kids. The amazing thing, the thing I didn't expect is, is when the judge made the decree, the first thing they did was write birth certificates out with Sandy's name and my name. <laughs> it was the court's decree. It was the judge's declaration. 
this is the child of Bill or Norton William Smith III. <laughs> and Sandra, yeah, he barely got it on the line on the little short form, you know. Everybody who was there was blessed to see it, amen? The judge was blessed to say, yeah, that's your child. Then John continues on, therefore, right? Therefore, there's a causation. There's a cause followed by an effect. The cause is this, you've been adopted into the family of God. The effect is the world does not know us because it did not know him. You see, the world doesn't appreciate those who no longer identify with the world. But instead, they, they're part of a new family. They're part of a new clan. Have you felt that separation too, coming to faith? I remember when I came to faith and all my drinking buddies were, hey, Bill, you coming down the club? No, nah, really doesn't fit my life anymore. Distance was put there. The jokes began, you know, I, it's all right. I'm not going to sit there and try to make the world accept me. I don't think that's the Christian's call. His call is to practice righteousness. And, and I say, when the, when the world, when people in the world are going through hard times, they're not looking for people that look like the world. They're looking for people who practice righteousness. But all of us have felt that estrangement from the world because we've been adopted into a different family. Let's face it, the worldly Hatfields do not appreciate the real McCoys. That's another old person reference. I'm just... <laughs> they only get older as I get older. It's an interesting thing. <laughs> but it is an evidence of the divine adoption. The world doesn't know you because it doesn't know God. And being reconciled to God, listen, gang, I can't say this enough, being reconciled to God comes at a social cost. If you're going to work to be accepted by the world, then it's going to come at the cost of your testimony. And if you work on your testimony, it's going to come at the cost of the world's grip on you. Jesus said this in John chapter 1, verses 10 to 13. Well, John says this about Jesus, I should say. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but by God. It's a new birth. It's a spiritual birth. A new nature has been placed inside of us. So the first benefit then of God's righteousness, of course, is the divine adoption. Now, verse 2, we look at future glory. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That is, those who come to faith in the Son of God, they're now the children of God, right? I used to be fill in the blank, but now I'm a child of God. Not his child later. John says now, presently. There's an emphasis he place here. Be, beloved, now we are the children of God. You don't become his child the day you die and you step into eternity. You're his child now. That's why you feel the love. Sometimes it's in the form of blessings and sometimes it's in the form of spankings. Nevertheless, it's all love. And John says, it has not been, yet been revealed what we shall be. Now, all of us understand here that we're being changed eternally, but we don't know exactly what the end result is going to look like. Now, I try to imagine what a sinless bill would look like. The problem is I've never met one. Amen? This past week, I was talking to a friend of mine. Some of you, you guys remember him, Darren. Darren was part of the church 14 or 15 years ago. Darren has some major, major developmental disabilities. Uh, and I was talking to him. He lives in Minnesota now, and so we're talking. And he wants to come up here, and he wants to jump the train, hang out with the family, you know. But he was talking about his disabilities, and 
you know, I was talking about my shortcomings too, you know, we're having one of those pity parties over the phone, you know. But then we kind of imagine what would it be like the day that we cross into eternity in the twinkling of an eye, however it's going to happen. What's it going to be like when there's the, the perfect Darren without the developmental issues? What's it going to be like when there's a perfect Bill without the pride, you know? I mean, we were just musing on, hey, what's that going to be like? I don't know exactly. Like, like the Apostle Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 13, we see through a glass dimly. John continues on, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So there's something I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to look like. I don't know exactly what this, this new body and the 2.0, the bugs worked out, all that. I don't know what that's going to look like exactly, but I do know that when he appears, I'm going to be like him. That's some good news, amen. I don't know. I, I had to look at myself in the mirror this morning. I'm looking forward to some improvement. How about you? And I'm not talking about the physical. I'm, I'm looking at the mirror that reveals everything. Let me encourage you if I can, because for some of you, living with yourself isn't easy. I'm one of them. Our expectations of ourselves tend to be higher than the Bible's expectations of ourselves. For some reason, we're surprised when we fail. The scriptures aren't. But whatever your personal challenges and disappointments are, please remember this. God has adopted you without reservation. No resentment. He's pleased that you're part of the family. And number two, you are in the process of being changed. And one day you will stand before him and the change will be complete. In light of that, let's focus on our future hope and focus a little less on our present frustrations. How about if all of us in here viewed each other as the finished product? I'm not talking between rows. I'm talking about husbands and wives even. Or parents and teenagers. Would you view your, each other as finished products? Because it could probably make life a little less frustrating, huh? It would be a lot better if we leave here today thinking the best of one another rather than, oh, that one's fat, that one's weird, this one's dumb, this one can't sing, blah, 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 blah. Give me a break. Get over it, you know? I, I know, we laugh. You know why? Because it really happens, doesn't it? We don't want to admit it, but it really happens. But we're called to practice a different righteousness. Not a self-righteousness, but God's righteousness. So... Benefits, of course, are the, uh, the divine adoption. There's the future glory. But also in verse 3, there's a present sanctification. For John says this, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, what is hope? That's another one we have to define. Because most of the time we think about hope, we think about the state lottery or something like that. You know, a one in a million shot. But biblical hope is the earnest expectation that something good is going to happen. And so while you and I have this certain hope to look forward to, we also sort of have a present to live in as well. And for you and I who hold to that certain hope of our eternal future with Him, there's a purifying effect that takes place in our lives. Listen, when I look forward to eternity, the world loses its grip on me and I lose my grip on the world. The more I look forward to the eternal things. When I think about stand, all of us standing before the Father in our final form, you don't bug me so much. And I pray I don't bug you so much. And when I live for the things of heaven, then the things of earth become very petty. And so there is a purification that takes place. It's just not ter in terms of morality. It's also in terms of priority. Now, as we move on to verse 4, John sort of changes gears and he turns our attention from those who practice righteousness and are being purified to those who are not. Verse 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Now, when we see words like sin and lawlessness, we think they're synonymous, and, and they can be. 
the word sin here is hamartia. It speaks of an offense. And then lawlessness, right? Anomia speaks literally of a violation of the law, but figuratively it was used to denote wickedness. In fact, that word is most often translated wickedness in the New Testament. But what's John's point here? Well, remember that this is in the context of, of the effects of Gnosticism on the early church. And these, these Gnostics came on the scene, and, and of course their view of, of life and that all matter is evil and, and all spiritual things are wholly good. And, you know, there's a, a sort of Epicurean mindset had developed among some of them where they're living very licentious lives. Like, if the whole world's evil, then what, what hope do I have of escaping it except through my esoteric knowledge? And so, why even fight it? They began to live very debased lives, but people who live very debased lives very often claim that they're really not that bad at all. I did it, and all those guys in the military were witnessing to me. I'm like, yeah, maybe I am a sinner. God created me that way. You know? <laughs> Everybody else is doing it, right? I'm really not that bad. Look at the guys I'm hanging out with. I'm actually a saint compared to them. John cuts through all of that, and he says, whoever commits sin commits lawlessness, or he who sins commits wickedness. You see, the world does have a way of trying to minimize the severity of sin. I'll give you some examples. Politicians don't lie, they misspeak. That one just annoys me. I can think of one in particular, and I won't name them, there's no need to. But I'm like, you misspoke? No, dude, you're a liar, let's just be honest. An adulterous affair is called a fling. Oh, it's just a fling. Thievery is qualified as misappropriation. Getting trashed is partying. Listen, there are even elements in our society today that are trying to rid our culture of the term sex offender in the hopes of, of, of using some term that's less offending. But this is what's going on. And, and this is the effect that the early church was feeling is that these false teachers are coming in and, and they're minimizing their sin. And John says, no, no, if you commit sin, you, you commit wickedness. So now having reestablished the seriousness of sin, John continues on, verse 5, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. Now, he says, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sin. Well, who was manifested? Jesus Christ, this is speaking of the incarnation, the manifestation of God, the, the physical, bodily, flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. You have to understand that the atonement had to be a physical atonement. And Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 tells us why, where the writer of Hebrews says, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. God's justice demands the spilling of blood for sin. And so the incarnation had to be a flesh and blood incarnation. Now, why would God go through such great lengths to provide atonement for our sins? Well, the answer is quite simple, right? Sin is absolutely offensive to, towards him. It's, it's wickedness. And man has no hope of atoning for himself before a perfectly righteous judge. See, you can, you can minimize sin verbally, but you can't minimize it judicially. The judge of the ages still views sin in absolute terms. Please understand, God does not feel the pressure to understand terms and uh, understand sin in Gnostic terms or in contemporary terms. His view of sin is absolute. That's never going to change. And John also writes, and in him there is no sin. That is, the atonement that was provided for us was pure and spotless, a perfect atonement. He lived the model life. The writer of Hebrews also tells us in Chapter 4, verse 15, that we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points was tempted as we are, yet without sin. You know, I was having lunch with a gentleman this week, guys going through just some crazy stuff, you know. And, 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 and crazy enough that he, like Job, he wants to question God. 
And, and I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. I think God can handle the questioning. But he's like, I, but I understand, I, I, I want to question God, but God doesn't owe me anything. You know, I'm just a deplorable bit of water and sand. And, and I was like, yeah, it still didn't ring true. And I'm like, listen, man, um, let me just tell you, yeah, sure, we're water and sand. And, and maybe in, in some absolute sense, we don't have the right to question God, but let us not forget that we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weakness. Can I just say that? Because sometimes, and I guess it's maybe within the Reformed brothers, sometimes it's so much God, God, and I get it, and I don't even disagree, but there's another piece that comes into it and that God understands, and God cares, and God's compassionate. And somehow, in just arguing one side or bringing in that one qualification apart from the others, God gets misrepresented, where he becomes this great cosmic ogre which is anything but what the writer of Hebrews says here in chapter 4, verse 15. Move on to verse 6 here. I see my notes are out of order a little bit, so we're going to be jumping back and forth. Verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin... Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now we're turning our attention back again to the, to the born-again person. But let's remember the primary principle of chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. All right? We have been born of him. His nature is perfect. Therefore, we don't live lives characterized by sin. However, it's not that we're without sin. Do we understand that? If we look at chapter 1, verses 8 to 10, John wrote this, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. And yet here in verse 6, John says, Whoever abides in Him does not sin. What does that mean exactly? Well, again, don't forget that first principle. That sets the context by which we understand everything else here. John isn't referring to isolated acts of sin, but sin that characterizes someone's life. If if you've been born from above and abiding in Him, living the life of our Lord, then your lifestyle will show a consistent pattern of righteousness, but not perfection. Now, how do you define a, a habitual life? of sin or the practice of righteousness. John never actually tells us. He leaves that for us to work out in our own hearts. And in light of that, can I just say this? Don't take these verses, you know, and then look around for somebody in the church that you can apply it to. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can get them with this one. That person really needs to hear this. Don't, don't do that, right? These things we should apply to our own hearts first. Let's work on the planks before we deal with the specs. How's that sound? John continues in verse 6, whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now, again, remember the context of the false teachers that had moved into the church, right? Those who, how do I say this? Hmm. You can't live a sinful life and claim to know God. Those who do neither see him, that is perceive him, nor do they know him experientially. Moving on to verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Again, he speaks of in, in endearing terms, right? The word technon, it's the seventh time he uses it here. He uses the phrase little children, I think nine times, but seven of them, it's this word technon. And he says, little children, let no one deceive you. That puts the initiative on you. The deceivers are always going to be out there. Whether or not you're deceived, that's up to you. That's why John's been affirming God's truth throughout this this particular letter. Now, the word deceive here, planeo, means to roam, to go astray, to err, or to seduce, or to wander away from. So John is writing endearingly saying, hey, deception or seduction was in the church. Don't fall prey to it. 
He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous, right? To be born of God is to share in that righteous nature. While we're not perfectly righteous in our nature, we are nevertheless righteous positionally in him. And because we're declared righteous by God, therefore we seek to live accordingly. I don't care what Miley Cyrus or Van Halen says, you can't have the best of both worlds. True story. Verse 8, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So just as those who are born of God bring forth righteousness, so those who continue in sin do so because they are of the devil, what John says. Well, that doesn't sound very nice. That almost sounds offensive. You notice that John doesn't give a choice, right? Either you're of the devil or you're born of God, right? Bob Dylan said the same thing in 1979, right? You've got to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. How many of you remember that? 79? Like four people raise your hands. You. <laughs> yeah. It's time to hand this pulpit off to somebody who's a little younger, I suppose. You have to understand, gang, it wasn't like we were young people and we wandered onto the highway to hell. The fact is we were born on it. We're all born of the corrupted nature. I wasn't corrupted after I came from my mother's womb. I was corrupt even while I was there. But those who've placed their faith in Christ have been adopted into a different family. And so therefore, I bring forth something different. I have a different practice. I have a different way of living. So do you. Continuing on, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Destroy here, it's interesting. I don't understand why the English translators, and I think almost all of them do, use the word destroy, but literally it means to loosen, to break, to dissolve, or to put off. And so one effect of our Lord's atonement is the undoing or the loosening of sin's effect on us. This is the redemption from sin. You, you understand, redemption comes in, in three forms, right? There's the past tense, justification. You're saved from the penalty of sin. That's Romans 3.21 to Romans 5.21. But then there's sanctification presently. You're being saved from the power of sin because you're practicing different things, right? That's Romans 6.1 to like 8.16. And then ultimately there's glorification, right? You'll be saved from the presence of sin altogether. That's Romans 8, 17 to 39. This is the purpose of the Son of God being manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil, as you be redeemed from the old life. Verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for a seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now remember, our premise, we share God's nature by the virtue of the new birth. God doesn't sin, and so therefore we do not practice sin. You have to understand, most of this here in Greek is in the present tense. Now, why is it that we don't practice sin? Because we're told here His seed is in us. Now, that interesting in Greek, that's the word sperma, but it would speak almost genetically. You have a new DNA. You have a, good, you have a new dad. Now, again, when I was a baby, nobody ever said, you look like your dad. Everybody always said, I look like my mother when I was a baby. But as I've gotten older, I'm taking on my dad's likeness. You can see it. My wife will be like, I'll, I'll be look, looking out over the horizon, clenching my teeth. She's like, you look just like your dad right now. My father loves dad jokes. What can I say? It's not my fault. I was born that way, right? <laughs> my mother 
hates dad jokes. And I hate the fact that I love dad jokes. Amen? That's... But may it be all the more so as it relates to our Heavenly Father. May we continue to grow in His likeness and not live life's contrary to His likeness. Remember, the, the, the Gnostics had come in the church and John is laying out these sort of qualifications. So it's very clear in our minds, from God's perspective, what is right and what is not. And John says, and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. That is, he cannot continue to remain in sin. Let me ask a question. I think all of us in here struggle with sin. In one form or another, whether it's overt or it's, it's things that other people can't see. Let me ask you a question. Are you struggling against it? Because if you're struggling against it, I have great hope. But if you're not struggling against it and you're quite content to be in that kind of a situation, I fear for you. Because dead men don't feel the struggle. But a guy who's alive and alive in Christ does feel the struggle. He does fight against it. However, the Gnostics, these false teachers who come into the church, they weren't struggling. They were making excuses and they were rationalizing, rationalizing their behavior, sort of wrapping it in metaphysical wordplay. But don't be deceived, gang. Profundity is not verity. Just because something sounds deep doesn't mean it's true. I grew up on a farm. Manure can be very, very deep. Wow, that's deep, bro. Yeah, let me show you something else at the bottom of the, you know, the, you know, the drop holes from the cattle right down into the basement of the barn, you know. There's a lot of deep stuff there, too. Just because something is profound doesn't make it true. And there's a lot of people come into church and they got like this really crazy idea and make it sound really profound. People buy into it, you know. I... Verse 10. In this, the children of God... And the children are the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So how can I know if I'm truly born again? Am I born of God or, I am, or, or am I of the devil? John gives the final word on that in two qualifications. Number one, whoever does not practice righteousness is not from God. It's about what you practice and what characterizes your life? See, the divine adoption is more than proclaimed, it's practiced. Our righteous works, your habit of living. By the way, practice isn't easy. Not everybody wants to do that. You know, I, I woke up this morning, I got these big rubber bands I'm supposed to do my physical therapy on, you know, and I, of course, I've been meditating in this all week, and I saw that, and I'm like, nah. I got to leave for church in two hours. I don't have time, you know, to do that. <laughs> but, you know, practice is hard. This idea of, of practicing righteousness doesn't come naturally. There is an effort that we do have to put into it. Let me say this. What you preach, you may not practice. But what you practice is what you do preach. So he says, hey, how, how, how do you know if you're born of God or not? How do we know if this guy is born of God or not? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not from God. Then he gives a second qualification here, nor is he who does not love his brother. Now, John begins this transition from practicing righteousness as God's children to loving our brother as God's children. And that's the topic from verse 11 through 24 of this chapter. All right, so we'll tackle that issue next week. How's that sound? All right, uh, we'll look at the practice of loving our brother as God's children when we finish chapter three next week. John's laid out some pretty heavy stuff. Uh, what makes it particularly difficult is some of the way the language is structured in 1 John. But if we uh, 
you take your time, you define some terms, you keep it in context, it does emerge as you meditate on it. So I encourage you to continue to do the same. Read ahead next week, all right? And uh, if you find practice hard this week, that's a good thing. Amen. All right. And I promise I'll pick up my rubber bands and do my physical therapy and, you know.